Hi, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is uh, KK Yeo from the National Heart Centre Singapore. Welcome to AICT Asia PCR 2021. Today, our session is on vascular access management in the cath lab, a session sponsored by Abbott Vascular. Today's learning objectives are number one, to learn how and when to use ultrasound for vascular access, to identify which vessel closure works best for you, and to learn how to reduce vascular access closure device complications. With us today, we have an exciting panel and a very strong panel of speakers and uh, moderators. Uh, with, me, with us as a remote uh, discussant and speaker will be Dr. Natawood from Bangkok, Thailand, and Dr. Jayakantan from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Moderating this session with me is uh, Dr. Jonathan Yap over here. And uh, Jonathan? At this juncture, I would like to um, remind all participants to be able to put their questions and comments in the chat box online. And our panel will strive to uh, answer all these questions during their question and answer and discussion section. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Nata Wood to teach us today on how to use ultrasound to guide vascular access. Dr. Nata Wood, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Natwood Bobaparat. I'm Director of Cadet Catheterization Repertory at Faculty of Medicine, Mahidon, Faculty of Medicine, Zirat Hospital, Mahidon University. It's my pleasure to be here to give a talk on other cell pipe puncture, how we do it in the cat lab setting. I have no disclosure. Other cell guide puncture have been first introduced since 1970. I have randomized control try, looking at the full scopic versus other cell guide puncture for pivotal artery cannulation. There actually is no difference between full scopic or other cells in the obese patient, in the patient with PAD. But in the patient who have the high bifurcation of femoral artery, other cell sky puncture have taken advantage. And you can appreciate the more operator have been used other cell skies or femoral with it, they will have more chance of success. The current trend in the cath lab, I think majority of the patients, we are going for transradial. And most of the time for the surveys over the continent for fit transfemoral access for choreograms will be just palpation or just air fluoroscopy, a little bit with other cells. But let's look at the current practice. Even though uh, we do uh, transradial more for choreograms, but now in the current practice, we changed the valve in the cat lab. Many patients undergoing for structural heart disease, for TAVI, the deep valve replacement, uh, or patient need an entire intercalation like ECMO. There will become a need to clean vascular access to reduce the complication. This is the incidence and trend of vascular complication of post TAVI. You can see even the sheet size is with significant reduction, but there's still chance that you might have encountered about 10% of the patient might have vascular complication. And once they have this, the outcome is much poorer. So there's a need to get the clean access and that the other cell sky puncture can help you. So first, before you do the anything, you need to know the anatomy. You need to know the basics. Femoral artery sit in the between the femoral triangle. Superior part is inguinal ligament, as I can show you here. The medial part is abductor longus muscle, and lateral part is central wrist muscle. If you move from medial to lateral, you have venous artery and nerve. For the artery, 
external iliac once past internal ligament is become common femoral and you have the branch of inferior epigastric takeoff as a marker. Once it's come along down, common femoral artery separate into superficial femoral and deep femoral. And this is the good location for the puncture. If you puncture too high above inguinal ligament, you will have risk of complication of little bleeding. If your puncture is too low, you have a chance risk of the pseudoaneurysm or AV fistula. And if you get the good and clean access, pre-close will be much easier and less complication. So once we know anatomy, the next thing is equipment. Usually you require 7.5 megahertz linear outer cell flow. You need to have the sterile outer cell flow cover, take a frame, sterile outer cell gel, or sterile normal cell line. I like to do is step by step. And this is the step that I will go over with you in next five minutes. So it's crucial, especially who undergoing for structural heart disease, that they usually have pre-existing CT. You just cannot uh, know what size to access because femoral is big enough. You need to go through and review the CT through low rate. Because from the CT, you will get information where the calcium is. This is uh, any peripheral vascular disease involvement, calcium anterior or posterior, whereas a femoral bifurcation takeoff is high bifurcation. You need to puncture a little bit higher or it's low bifurcation. Like on this case, you can puncture on both sides without any problems. On the other case, like this one, you can appreciate from the CT on the right common femoral, you have entry of wall calcification. So knowing this, you know that you have to go on the left side, which is more toward posterior wall calcium. And this will make you safe for approach. On this case, patient have significant peripheral vascular disease. You can appreciate uh, significant PAD on both SF SFA, but you still can do it. You just need to puncture a little bit higher. On the left side, you have the, some posterior wall calcium, lumen is okay. But again, knowing information, and then you can use the other cell sky for the clean entry wall stick and to help you succeed with our complication. Once you go through with the CT, I will then. Uh, Start with fluoroscopic. It's always a good to, where to know where to start, where no is a common femoral head. And once I identified it, I will prepare my steroid probe. I put I, a steroid at the south probe uh, cover, put take a dump pad on the tip of the probe. And once it's ready, I rinse either normal saline or the right other structure. Then I will start obtaining longitudinal view of the common femoral artery. This way you have the bird eye point overview of the femoral artery. You know where the bifurcation is, where it's calcium, what is a possible suitable site for puncture. And then once you have that, you rotate probe clockwise to obtain cross-sectional view of the femoral artery. And this view, you will appreciate the bifurcation and femoral vein. And then you move the probe clinically out from the femoral bifurcation. On this case, you can appreciate at this size, you have anterior ball calcium. So you know that you need to move a little bit further out from anterior wall calcium 
to get the suitable spot for puncture. Then just basic subcutaneous injection with like the cane and you start your puncture. And the puncture, you close a look on the tip of the needle and you appreciate the tenting of the common femoral artery. And you know that you have anterior wall puncture. So I have been reviewed over for necessity of other south type puncture in the cat lab setting in current practice, even though we use more with radio approach, but with structural intervention with the patient with required anticoagulation like ECMO, you need a clean puncture like at the South Guide. You understand anatomy, basic equipment, and I went over for step approach how to do it in cat lab setting. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Natawood. That's a very nice uh, uh, example. Um, but I know you have another example. I think you have another case on a video to show us uh, more details on uh, ultrasound guided access. Uh, can we go to Dr. Natawood's uh, second video, please? Hello. My name is Dr. Natawood Bumpaparat. I'm director of Kadak Cat Lab at Faculty of Medicine, Sirat Hospital, Midon University. It's my pleasure to show the video of ultrasound guide puncture, how I do it in the cat lab setting. So let's first start with the equipment. Usually you will need 7.5 megahertz of linear ultrasound probe. We have the sterile ultrasound probe cover. You have the thicker frame. And you can use either sterile normal cell light or sterile ultrasound gel. In the case patient with especially with structural heart, heart disease, when they have the CT done before, it would be nice to review the CT to access the femoral artery on both sides. And you can appreciate from the CT for the puncture size, which size is better, whereas the calcium is located. Is this anterior wall or posterior wall? How is the relation to the femoral head? So then once you get the CT, you put the outer, sterile outer cell probe cover over linear outer cell probe. You put the tachyderm pad on top at the tip of other cell probe. Make sure there is uh, no air. Then usually I will start with the fluoroscopy to identify where the femoral head. And this is, will be the good place to put the other cells And then you can put either sterile normal cell light or sterile other cell gel. On this case, since we have taken the frame at top of the probe, we can use even just normal cell light. Then I will obtain longitudinal view of the common femoral artery. On this view, you can appreciate where the femoral bifurcation, and this you can see the calcium more associated in the posterior wall on this patient. Then you rotate clockwise to obtain cross-sectional view of the femoral bifurcation. On this view, you can see a uh, bifurcation of the femoral artery together with the femoral vein. And then you move probe cranially and until you out from the femoral bifurcation and choose where the puncture size which is, should be free from entry of wall calcification. From this step in the patient, um, in general, you can put local anesthesia, but on this case, patient have GA, so we need to put the uh, needle directly. 
we puncture common femoral artery at the 45 angle on the other side of you should be appreciate the tenting of the femoral and that's why you get the anterior wall puncture. Thanks, uh, Dr. Nathwood. That's a very nice uh, illustration, and it's good to see how you do it in a live situation, so to speak. Well, now we have some time for discussion, and maybe I can start off with uh, Dr. Nathwood yourself. I mean, very nice cases. I can't help but want to ask, I mean, now with radio cases, and you know, not everybody does Tevers. So, for the average person in the care lab, why would you argue that ultrasound-guided puncture is useful? I think um, it's very important. Uh, as you mentioned, we now move uh, coronary for toward radio. I think for the young operator, the experience is very important. And uh, once you don't have much experience and you go uh, occasional to the femoral artery, complication will be occur. And I think ultrasound guide puncture is help reduce complication, especially if the case uh, that uh, required, uh, I mean, if the case like require like a big cheat or if the case that uh, have like a condition that may be prone toward complication like patient need to be on ECMO, on heparin or patient on uh, atrial fibrillation undergoing PCI and you cannot go radio, I think you, and you need to go back on that calculation. I think that that will be the one that uh, prone toward the problems. And after anatomy like obesity patient, uh, patient with peripheral vascular disease, so I think Knowing ultrasound guide puncture is help you a lot, and uh, its complication will reduce. And I think for the next part, I think we will discuss with using the uh, closing device. And if you want to successful at the closure device, I think they have another study that clean anterior wall puncture will help you a lot. Because if you're not a uh, good anterior wall puncture or you uh, puncture on the calcium, I think complication with closure device will be occur. Thanks, uh, Dr. Nathawood. And um, maybe I can just direct this question to uh, Dr. Uh, Jayakantan. You know, um, there are certain scenarios which uh, uh, Nathawood has described, you know, obese patients, patients with peripheral arterial disease. But in your practice, do you do it for everyone? And, or would there be patients that you would, you know, more likely to be using it? And what would your advice to a, a proceduralist starting out, what would it be? Uh, I mean, ideally, I would love to use uh, ultrasound guided puncture for every single one of my patients, uh, especially if we're going femoral. But um, at this juncture, ultrasound guided, we use it more for, you know, I think that another word has pointed out, you know, obese patients, patients who I, have, uh, I feel that might have um, some calcifications, which I want to try to avoid because I need to use a bigger sheet and uh, I need a clean puncture. So these are the kind of patients that usually I use ultrasound guided for. Uh, honestly, most of the time we use fluoro guided puncture, but I, I think uh, it, there are small number of patients where they have high bifurcation and we miss those if we don't use ultrasound guided. So uh, again, um, if you have a busy cath lab with many numbers, maybe not all patients, not practical to use ultrasound for all patients, even if uh, probably that is, would be the safest option. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Jared Nathan. Um, John, uh, for yourself in your practice, uh, what, what do you do in the cath lab here in Singapore? Do you do it for all your patients uh, for femoral access? Right, right now, uh, I don't do it for all my patients. I do it for selected patients. But one very important advice I, I would like to give, you know, as I learn from my journey, is that you really, there's a learning curve in using ultrasound. And uh, when you first start off, I would suggest for all operators to use it for every single case so that you understand the feedback your probe has to your hands and, and, and to the needle. And from there, you know, once you become more experienced, you, know, you can actually select your cases. Because to start off your first case on an obese patient who really needs ultrasound but you have never used it frequently, it's going to be really tough. Yeah, I think, I think that's my experience too. Um, you know, um, for the really difficult patients, if, if, say for example, for an obese patient, sometimes when you press on the ultrasound probe, the belly pushes back on your hand and you, you realize that the ultrasound is actually very difficult to do so. But the, if you are experienced doing it, then it helps a lot. So I think we have heard that um, you know, ultrasound can be used in difficult patients, patients who are obese, patients with peripheral arterial disease. 
but we've also heard that it might be good to, um, to start your journey using ultrasound in, in the less difficult patients so that the experience uh, helps you when the time comes for the difficult patients. But of course, ultrasound is just one part of vascular access. I would say that uh, perhaps the next part is on how do we then do uh, vascular access closure. And here I want to have a segue into our next video, which is on a step-by-step -step video on the use of the ProGlide uh, vascular access closure uh, device. So video, please. Basic deployment. Positioning. Perform a femoral angiogram through the introducer sheath to verify that the access site is in the common femoral artery. To avoid posterior wall suture placement and possible ligation of the anterior and posterior walls of the femoral artery, fluoroscopically evaluate the femoral artery for size, calcium, tortuosity, and for disease or dissections of the arterial wall. Place an 038 or smaller guide wire through the introducer sheath. Remove the introducer sheath while applying pressure on the groin to maintain hemostasis. Backload the device over the guide wire until the guide wire exit port of the sheath is just above the skin line. Remove the guide wire before the exit port crosses the skin line. Continue to advance the device until a continuous flow of blood is evident from the marker lumen. Position the device at a 45 degree angle. Deploy the foot by lifting the lever marked number one on the top of the handle. Gently pull the device back to position the foot against the arterial wall. If proper position of the foot has been achieved, blood marking will cease or be significantly reduced. Needle deployment. While maintaining device position, deploy needles by pushing on the plunger assembly in the direction marked number two until the collar of the plunger makes contact with the proximal end of the body. Visually confirm that the collar of the plunger is in contact with the body of the device. Plunger removal. Pull the plunger back in the direction marked number three and completely remove the plunger and needles from the body of the device. One suture limb will be attached to one end of a link. The other end of the link will be attached to the anterior needle. The posterior needle will be free of suture. Pull back on the plunger until the suture is pulled taut. Cut the suture from the anterior needle distal of the link using the quick cut mechanism located on the handle. Suture retrieval. Relax the device and then return the foot to its original position by pushing the lever marked number four on the top of the device down to its original position. Withdraw the device until the guide wire port exits the skin line. Grasp the suture adjacent to the sheath and pull the suture ends through the distal end of the proximal guide. The rail suture limb is blue and longer and is the suture limb that will be used to advance the knot. The non-rail suture limb is white and shorter and will be used to tighten the knot. Knot advancement. Securely wrap the blue rail around your left forefinger. Gently pull on the rail suture, keeping the suture coaxial to the tissue tract. Completely remove the per-close proglide from the artery. With the blue rail securely wrapped around your left forefinger, Place the white non-rail between your left thumb and left forefinger. Place both sutures into the suture trimmer by retracting the thumb knob on the handle and load the suture into the window located at the distal end of the suture trimmer. Release the thumb knob to load the suture. Advance the knot. With the blue rail securely wrapped around the left forefinger, release the white non-rail and place the suture trimmer under the left thumb to assume a single-handed position and complete knot advancement. With the suture trimmer in place, tighten the knot by gently pulling the white non-rail. Remove the suture trimmer from the tissue tract. Challenge and confirm the close on the table. Test for hemostasis by having the patient cough or bend his or her leg. <coughs>
If hemostasis has not been achieved, assume the single-handed position for 20 seconds or until hemostasis is achieved, securing the knot again by gently pulling on the white non-rail suture limb. Do not apply excessive pressure to the suture. If hemostasis cannot be achieved, apply manual compression. Suture trimming. Once hemostasis is achieved, use the suture trimmer to trim the sutures below the skin. While holding constant back tension on the suture limbs, load both limbs into the suture trimmer and advance to the arteriotomy. Trim the sutures by pulling back on the red trimming lever. Keep the trimming lever pulled back during retrieval of the suture trimmer. So I think we see a very nice uh, video. Uh, I wish I had that when I was in training. Um, uh, but that is a very nice illustration of how to use the device. So maybe some questions um, to our uh, live discussions and to uh, John here. And I'm going to ask this of everyone, you know. Um, what are the key factors that uh, help you decide on uh, your choice of closure device and how many do you know and what do you use in your lab? Maybe, maybe uh, Dr. Nutterwood first. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. So for, for me, I, um, for all my Tavi case, uh, it will be closure device. Uh, so I use uh, all the uh, uh, pre close and, and usually I, I will do like a two pull crack, two pull five pre, pre close uh, for 14 French, eight, uh, 16 French, 18 French. But lately, uh, I just also look at the vessel size as well. I mean, if the vessels is uh, less than 5.5, I have also borderline uh, P PAD, I maybe do it with, with one pull cry. Uh, for regular um, coronary case, um, since um, all of my case is go radio, so I don't need any closure device. Uh, but uh, occasionally, if I have to go for the femorals, it depends on where I'm, I'm at. I've been at uh, my uh, university hospital, I have the fellows will be manual compression. <laughs> if at the private, <laughs> then it will be a uh, closure device. That's a very powerful closure device you have there. <laughs> uh, Dr. Jaya, what about you, Dr. Jaya? Uh, uh, pretty much pretty much the same, actually. Um, um, uh, uh, generally, um, if we do intervention, we have to use femoral. I, you know, we've thought most of our registrars to use uh, um, uh, either a uh, suture base, which is the proglide, or we have uh, angiosil as well in our lab. So we are quite familiar with both of this and um, uh, uh, we because we want a quick turnover, uh, we don't want to stress our staff too much. We try to close as many as possible. Um, but I, uh, if it's just a coronary angiogram, of course not. I mean, this having said that 95, 98% of our cases are radial. Um, but of course, for Thawi Evas, like I think Dr. Natawood has pointed out, you know, we, we pre-close most of our patients and uh, it, it helps to, you know, um, reduce procedural time and we are able to uh, successfully seal the groin with um, at these two proglides. Thanks. Uh, John, what about you? I mean, do you, would you, how do you choose your device and how do you choose which one if you have more than one device? So in our lab, we have two main devices, the NGO seal as well as the proglide. I think for coronary work, uh, in general, I'm actually ambivalent to both. I think when I decide to close, it's actually very practical. Number one is, of course, there are some cost considerations. And number two, as everyone has alluded to, you know, everyone's going radial nowadays. And so actually, you know, for our junior staff, when they take off femoral sheath, sometimes the experience has, is a bit less. So usually for me, if I use a bigger ball sheath, like a seven, eight French kind of sheath for some of my more complex PCI work, then these are some instances where I will uh, divert to using a closure device at the end of the procedure. Yeah, I think those are very good points. And, you know, John and I work in the same lab. And uh, as, as he mentioned, we have both the angel seal and the proglide. Uh, maybe I'll share a little bit of when I use the uh, angel seal and when I use the proglide. So first, um, I think the proglide has a certain unique advantages. One, you can repuncture. So for patients where I think there might be a possibility of repuncture, I would use the proglide. Uh, two, uh, in situations where I'm not quite certain of excess, and I think I might want to put the wire back if I'm not sure, I would be able to do so with the proglide. These are two very powerful advantages, and which is one reason why I strongly recommend for my trainees that they should 
as a closure device learn how to use the ProGlide. However, there are unique situations where I may not choose to use a ProGlide. Now, one example is if there is a lot of calcification and I, I'm not sure whether the needle will hold. Um, and the second is if there is significant tortuosity in the external iliac and I'm a bit worried that when I push um, the ProGlide in, uh, it might uh, catch on the vessel at an awkward angle. In those situations, I might choose the angel seal. I think it is always good to have more than one trick up your sleeve. So those are two situations where I think um, you might have the flexibility of choosing another device. Now with that in mind, um, and how often do you have to, um, can you use the ProGlide in a, say an 8 French sheath? I mean, what's your experience, uh, uh, John? I mean, do you use it for 8 French sheath? So uh, for me, um, I will use a single ProGlide for up to an 8 French sheath and I won't need to pre-close it. Anything bigger than an 8 French sheath, I will usually use the ProGlide with a pre-close technique and we can talk about that you know, uh, later on, on how to use it in a pre-close fashion. Yeah, and that answer, I think, is a good segue to our next uh, lecture, which talks about when and, you know, the when and the safety and efficacy of vessel closure um, uh, compared to manual compression and PCI. So maybe I'll now hand over to uh, Dr. Jayakantan's uh, lecture. Uh, over to the lecture, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jaya. I'm from the National Heart Institute of Malaysia. I'm a cardiologist. Um, thank you for... Uh, inviting me to share with you about the safety and efficacy of vascular closure device versus manual compression. Now, despite the growing popularity of radial access, there is still significant use of femoral access for percutaneous coronary intervention. The use of femoral vascular closure devices improve patient comfort and expedite ambulation, uh, and the use of VCD is thought to reduce excess site-related bleeding complications. Now, if we look at the current guidelines uh, from the ACCAHA, which is quite old, I might add, um, of course, the gold standard uh, for uh, femoral access is uh, manual compression. The use of VCD is said to be reasonable to achieve faster hemostasis, shorter duration of bed rest, and possibly improve patient comfort. And that's a like, class 2A indication. Now, and uh, it should not be used routinely for specific purpose of reducing vascular complications. So it, it's a class 3 indication there. So let's, uh, and femoral and, Excess complications vary from 2 to 6%. Uh, it's low in the young and uncomplicated cases with a short procedure time and increasing with more complex patient and um, longer duration of procedure. Interestingly, uh, females are more at risk of femoral complications. Now, let's look at some evidences in trials to see if uh, we see this do uh, are safe and efficacious. Now, uh, this study from Germany, the ISA closure trial, compared VCD-based uh, strategy with Femocil and Exocil against manual compression in about 4,500 patients. The primary endpoint of excess site-related vascular completion in 30 days were actually similar, about similar in both groups, 6.9% and 7.9%. Um, and the British Cardiovascular Interventional Society went a step further and they wanted to see if the use of VCDs could reduce 30-day mortality in about 270,000 patients uh, where it was used. And they did some propensity matching and the use of VCDs was found to be associated with a small but statistically significant benefit in 30-day mortality, 1.8% versus 2% and it was the effect was more pronounced in females and acute presentations. Uh, but however, I have to warn you that there were probably many confounding factors that were not taken into account uh, in this study. Now, uh, there are many small studies um, uh, use of VCD. So meta analysis is a way for us to see if if uh, they are actually useful. Uh, would they change the way we practice? So now uh, coronary. Uh, Coroney and team looked at 30 trials involving about 4,000 patients. They found that the overall time to hemostasis was reduced by a mean of 17 minutes uh, by using VCDs. There were some non-significant trend towards increased uh, hematomas, bleeding, AV fistulas, and pseudoaneurysms with the use of VCD. Now, Robertson and his team uh, reviewed 52 RCTs and uh, they demonstrated a significant reduction in time to hemostasis when utilizing closure devices. Um, uh, moving forward to uh, Wimmer and his team, 
they uh, retrospectively analyzed about a million VCDs used, which showed modest reduction in vascular exercise site complications. Now, in this review, the global complication rate was about 1.5%, and there was a 0.4% absolute risk reduction in vascular access site complications. Um, uh, and moving to uh, Cox and team, uh, they reviewed 34 RCTs involving about 14,000 patients, 8,000 of them uh, use of VCDs. Again, they showed that it shortened time to hemostasis, allowed more rapid ambulation and earlier discharge compared to manual compression. And the complication rates were actually comparable in this uh, review, 13% for manual compression and 12% for ventricular closure device. They also interestingly reported a reduction in cost of about 13% using the VCD, probably allowing to earlier discharge lesser complications. So, so the overall data appears to conclude that VCDs are efficacious, but they do not demonstrate definitively their safety versus manual compression or versus each other. So um, my take is VCD is an important tool to improve comfort and reduce time to hemostasis if used in appropriate patients. I thank you, and I'll take any questions. Thanks, Dr. Jaya. That's a very nice and very um, you know, a clear discussion on the, the risks and benefits of using a VCD. Well, you know, while we were giving our talks and discussing, we have had some questions coming uh, from our Q&A and on the chat. So maybe I'll just ask uh, uh, John here to read out some of that. Maybe just with the first question. Okay, um, there's a question from Kian Soon, you know, and I would like to direct this to some of our panellists. For the, do you use the hybrid technique for large ball access closure? For example, instead of two crisscross proglides, you use a proglide and followed by an angio seal. Maybe uh, uh, not too good. Yes, um, um, I, I, I don't do that. Uh, uh, I, I, we, we have actually uh, one case that uh, patient have like, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's helpful, but you have to be very careful, put a lot of closure device on top of each other. Because we have the case that uh, we, we did the TAVI, we do two progrides and it's still uh, leakage. Uh, and we put the uh, angel seal on top <laughs> and so and we, we always uh, check after that uh, uh, angel post angiogram what it look like and we found it's uh, occluded of artery or have some impending closure so i think you you can do it but you have to be very careful i think uh, you have to evaluate a case by case uh, how 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 the pre uh, condition of the vessels look like uh, because uh, if it's a borderline case uh, i think uh, um, at that maybe have chance of vessel closure. I think you, you also need to be aware of complication that may, might be occur. And, and as I, you, I mentioned to you that uh, we used to prescribe, but uh, in some case, if the patient have pre-existing peripheral vascular disease and uh, vessels small, sometimes we can do with one prescribe and, and just uh, manual compression a little bit. And I think that's safer to the patient because we, we aim for discharge the patient next day, so I try to avoid complication. So I Thanks. think it's possible, but you need to know risk and benefit. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Jaya, what about you? Would you, you know, do a combo approach? Um, to be honest, uh, I mean, first of all, it's not, uh, it's not in either of the IFUs, but uh, I, I, would, I, I would be very wary. Uh, I, 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 I would not do it, to be honest, because maybe I don't have as much experience as Dr. Nathan would. Um, uh, I, I, most of the time, if we do fail with two, sometimes we put in a third proglide or, and then we'll just compress manually. Yeah, I think that's probably wise. I, first of all, it's not in the IFU. The second reason is that uh, for large bore devices, uh, if, if you think that the excess is not secured, you have alternatives, contralateral approach, balloon tamponade, and even surgical closure would probably give you better peace of mind for you to sleep at night. And for the, uh, you know, the diagnostic calves and the PCI as well, the worst thing you do is you hold manual pressure. So I think a hybrid approach is, you know, unless you're extremely experienced or unless there are specific instances, unique situations, I, I think all of us here would generally advise against it. Um, we have another uh, question. The vessel is very big. I think that, I think you can do that. I mean, if you have like over eight millimeter vessels and you have to cry, you have enough space because you have to remember that when you put the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, angel seal, you will have the anchoring 
add on top of it. So I think you need to space out innovations. Yep. John, there's another question, I believe. We have a question from Ibrahim. We would like to inquire about our strategy in reducing the risk of bleeding puncture site from the femoral excess post PCI in end stage renal failure patients. You know, these vessels can be calcified and they may not uh, hemostase as well and may bleed more. So, yeah, I think that's a tough question. Uh, maybe again, uh, maybe this time, uh, Dr. Jai, would you like to go first? Um, yeah, uh, I, think, I think there's always a feel when you're puncturing a calcified vessel. So, you know, you, you can feel that, that you can feel that roughness of the calcium when you're puncturing the needle. And, and a lot of times I take heat on that, even though if I do an angiogram, it doesn't, it doesn't seem so calcified. So uh, I generally avoid uh, and just as much as possible uh, uh, with calcium. But I mean, there are some techniques that you can use to uh, sort of elevate that. Um, we've been taught to punch the needle very slowly uh, and we've had some success, but um, if you want to teach the juniors calcified vessels, uh, you don't have enough experience, the best is to go with angiosteel and you probably uh, get the job done. What about you, uh, Dr. Nutterwood? Any special tips and tricks? And that, that's very important that use other cell guide, as we have mentioned. Because when you have the heavy calcified lesion, uh, it's not always uh, calcified all around circumferential. Sometimes it can be posterior ball calcium. You just need to find a spot and uh, where to puncture. Because if you punct, uh, puncture on the anterior ball calcium, any device will have problems because it's a uh, is a uh, uh, flexibility of vessel is not there. But uh, if you uh, uh, move the spot and find a spot that uh, is a uh, posterior ball calcium and then you have space there, I think you can very, very, very succeed uh, to do that. Uh, and I think it's very important as uh, uh, Dr. Yeo and Dr. Jonathan and, and Dr. Che have mentioned, the more you do it, is the better you are. So I think when you start not do on the difficult case, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm start, without outer cell guide too. So I, I have to relearn because um, uh, um, to do outer cell guide. So I think you, you just need to do a simple case, do all, all, all the time until you get experience. And, and once you have that, I think you will have a lot of uh, uh, very good success. I, I like a couple of nights ago, I have like a patient with dorsal speed uh, below knee uh, 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 occlusion. And we are also success with the outer cell guide for dorsal speed is and with the calcified by the spot. I think is is expand your your ability a lot. Uh, thank so thank thanks. Other side. Mm. Thanks very much for sharing that. Well, I think we are almost uh, to the end of today's session. Maybe I can have uh, uh, Jonathan here summarize our key learning points today. John. So in closing, I'd like to summarize some of our key take home messages. Firstly, we learned from Dr. Natawood the importance of using ultrasound for vascular excess closure. It helps you identify a spot on the common femoral artery above the bifurcation and it helps you pick out the cleaner spot so that you know you can minimize your complication rate. Next, we heard from Dr. Jaya on the benefits of using a vascular closure device, namely reduce hemostasis time and increase patient comfort. Of note, you know, most studies have not shown a reduction in complication rate. So it's very important for you to be familiar with whatever vascular closure device you have in your lab and gain experience with that. Lastly, we heard some very important pointers from uh, Dr. Yong on how to choose the vascular closure device. You know, if you want to maintain vessel access, then the ProGlide is very useful in that uh, scenario. And you know, if you have very tortuous arteries, you have to push your ProGlide in, then you know, you may want to consider something, another closure device. So lastly, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all our participants who have stayed with us through this session. You know, it's late on a Friday evening in Singapore. We hope you have had an enjoyable learning experience. Thank you. And uh, thanks to our uh, two uh, uh, remote discussants and speakers. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Natwood and uh, Jaya. Hope to see you in person. And uh, do stay with us. Uh, coming up next, the wrap-up of the day. Thank you. Thank you very thanks, much. Yeah. Okay, have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye.